Welcome to our um, episode today of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. Uh, we're joined today by Paul Kassman, who has developed a programme for people who've gone into gangs um, called Changed in the Game. And so he's, his focus on that programme is to think about how and why people go into gangs, what needs they meet by doing that, and then the impact of it. But what we wanted to talk about today a bit was about how... Um, young people are traumatised in the community and then how that might continue once they're in prison. Um, so Paul works mainly with young people, he's worked with adults as well, but um, his uh, a programme is, is sort of developed through looking at the trauma and, and the impact of people going into gangs. So welcome Paul, it's really nice to see you. Hi there, good to see you. So I wondered Paul if you'd like to say a bit about your experience of this, of having worked now for a few years now in ISIS, haven't you, with young people in ISIS, um, how, what you sort of found and Kate works with the young people too, so we were having to think about how that might be different to older adults. Um, well I think, um, you know, initially, I think, you know, going back maybe, you know, 10 years or 10 or 15 years ago, we, we were really looking around for interventions um that addressed um you know kind of gang culture and, and gang violence that, that we've seen and I, I think people were really struggling to really find a frame um you know to 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 carry that work forward um and to engage you know th this particular cohort and it, i think at, at the same time over the last 10 years we've started to become a lot more aware of risk and protective factors um associated with these young men mainly, they're main, mainly young men um and uh, you know kind of develop the conversations around adverse childhood experiences and more trauma informed approaches so having been a, a frontline um, practitioner in, in the communities you would normally find there was often a story behind a young person in, in a youth offending team or, or in a gang and there would normally be one or more significant um circumstances that that young person had had to face um which started to become a pattern in, in the young people um, that I worked with. So any young person coming into the, the youth justice system um, has their um, risk assessed. Um, the, the framework is called ASSET and it's quite exhaustive. You look at maybe 200 questions um, around this young person's life and you look at all the good things in their life that are gonna you know, help them develop positively. And we also look at all the negative things um, that could have um, a, an impact um, towards further criminality or further harm and, and you know, raises the risk. And I, I did some um, research when I was working in the policy field and we looked at 300 asset reports and there's a box um, that practitioners have to tick um, which, which addresses, does this young person have unmet emotional or psychological needs? And for two thirds of young offenders in London, that box is ticked. Um, and what we also know is, we, they also record, has there ever been any engagement with mental health or counseling services? And that's a much lower number. So we, we do know that in, in the youth justice system, there are a lot of young people with unmet psychological or, or emotional needs. Um, and, you can, you, when you drill down further, then we start to find kind of themes around exposure to domestic violence. So, you know, what happens to a child who, who's grown up in a house um, where there's domestic violence? You know, what, what's the impact of that on the child? How's that going to impact their behaviour at school? And, you know, the, the, it seems that if we look at school exclusions and school disciplinary processes, it's easier to talk about problem children rather than children with problems. And, and, and I think we can add um, a lot of other issues to that. So, you know, we, we, can, we can look at bereavement. You know, there, there are a very high number of children that experience bereavements of, of maybe a parent um, or a sibling. Um, there, there's often issues around parenting. So there could be issues with parental mental health, um, substance misuse, alcohol. And, and I think we, we, we come to realise that these problems never come in once. So they, they normally come in, in clusters. So there's, so I think as a starting point, we can look at a, you know, a cohort of young people who face really significant challenges um, in life very early, um, which might not be picked up um, early enough or, or effectively enough, and actually leave them very angry, very frustrated, very confused, 
And if you're 13 or 14, maybe the best place to take all your anger is onto the streets and, and in, into a gang and, and you've got an outlet um, for all of, all of that, you know, all of those emotions that you're carrying. And on top of that, you get recognition, you get, you get respect, you get a sense of status, you become important, you get the chance to, to gain money um, from it all. And it's, it's quite easily to slip into that lifestyle. And then obviously we know in that lifestyle, you face so much danger, so much trauma, um, so much fear um, associated with that. By the time they come to prison, um, you know, emotionally, they're in a really bad place. Um, without really realizing or had, having had time to stop and really think about or receive support, um, which is going to help them to really organize their, their thinking, organize how they feel about themselves, how they feel about the world, um, you know, their, their, you know, their, their worldview and, and their self image. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, th I think, you know, in, in terms of, of looking at the large numbers of young people, you know, who, who kind of, have lived this type of experience coming into the prison system, there's an opportunity to think about, well, how do we engage with them? Um, often they are very violent in the prison system. And, you know, obviously prison is about power and control. So we can control these young people. And in order to control them, we might have a narrative about them that they're dangerous and they need to be controlled because they've committed dangerous acts and dangerous crimes. Um, and sometimes that can crowd out you know, the need to actually sit down with the young people, um, engage with the young people and, and, and start to unravel, you know, what's been going on. And it can, you know, it, it can be a very long process, a very difficult process. Um, but that, that's the work that, 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 you know, we do in, in changing the game. Mm -hmm. um, I know you do similar work at Grendon, you know, with, with younger and older um, offenders. And, and obviously you've got, you know, a similar type of cohort at Ellsbury, Kate. So, you know, I'd be interested really just, you know, compare experiences, you know, in, in, I know we're all trying to do, achieve similar outcomes. That's really interesting what you're saying, Paul. One of our drives at the moment um, in forensic psychology is to look at the, the quality of our risk assessments um, and how culturally aware they are. And so I was wondering on that sort of questions, on the questions you're asking, are they taking account of um, you know, their, their intergenerational trauma, you know, the things that have happened to their parents before them, and as you said, the grief and um, bereavement they've suffered, um, and all those other aspects of, of their context that they're growing up in and what they're, who their role models are or not, or, or, or they haven't got role models. Um, all of that is something we're really trying to drive towards at the moment, and I'd be interested, I don't know that um, measure you're, you're mentioning, but that's um, something we're really trying to think about. And I think similarly, so I guess um, with some of the guys that I work with, um, exactly what you're, you're saying, Paul, there's been so many, I guess, when I see missed opportunities where perhaps interventions could have been put in place or perhaps maybe the person wasn't quite ready at that time for whatever reason. But I think sometimes it can be very easy to maybe think of um, violence or gang related violence or offending as an individual problem and I guess ignore actually the the role that society and the systems around the person play um, and I guess there's been a lot you know just kind of thinking about the point Jerry's making in forensic psychology we've been a lot more thoughtful about that actually more recently and there's been some really helpful models so one model I think is really helpful is the PTMF framework which kind of talks about actually you know people's development how power operated in people's lives and um, how people survived through the misuse of power so be that either intergenerational trauma it might be being excluded from school um, it might be racism as another example and actually what the kind of behaviors that people do the survival response and I think if we looked at offending or gang related violence as a public health issue more so than a um, you know the offending kind of narrative I think there might be a lot more thought around how we can put preventative measures in place so what might be the preventative approaches in the first instance that we might need to think about um, and kind of some of those missed opportunities yeah so that power threat meaning framework um, is a good way of looking at people's past without sort of trying to label people as is, is there the, the person that's the problem rather than seeing what was happening around you because mm. we know developmentally we all tend to move away from our family and towards our peers when we're you know going into puberty and teenage years and and if those people around you are people you're you're respecting and looking up to are people that have got easy money as they see it and cars and girls and all the things that they're looking for 
um, that can often really have a big impact and, and can be a draw to people um, because we probably all remember from our teenage years people we would have looked up to and thought oh, I'd like to be like that and then you know not really thinking of the way the brain's functioning at that time we're not always thinking about the future we're very impulsive we're very um, driven by how we're feeling today the, the adrenaline all of those things that are going to come and the kudos of being in a gang I guess the respect you think you're getting and all of those things that people get from being in those situations that you might then go and get by being um, a boy band or, or something else you know some other way someone's chosen to get those same things I think we often forget that there's people are usually trying to achieve something we've all tried to achieve but they've gone in a different way about it I think I think it's, it's important to really hold on to you know the, the you know if, if you grow up in a household you know, which doesn't give you a positive anchor, mm. um, you know, psychologically, you know, or, or emotionally, or which doesn't affirm you um, in, in a positive way. And, and you know, working with the, the young men that I've worked with, a, a lot of the, the households that, that they've had to, that they've grown up in have forced them into a survival instinct. Um, so if you grow up in a household where there is a lot of anxiety, um, mm. you know, or, or, or a lot of fear, and you don't, you know, as a very young child, have a, a framework to recognise um, what you're dealing with. I think it's going back to what you were saying, Kate. You know, the, the, the clues are often acted out at school, um, you know, and, and there are missed opportunities there. And I think, as you were saying, you know, once you get into adolescence, you know, the kind of, we know that there's a lot more impulsive, um, you know, and, and thrill-seeking behaviour, which is seen as part of adolescence. But... Mm -hmm. I think if you're a very anxious young person, so if you're living in a house where you don't know if mum's going to get beat up tonight, or you know, or if you know, they're, they're, you know, there's all all types of catastrophes that take place within you know the four walls of a family home, and even if they're not happening, you're always living under the fear of when the next episode um, is going to happen. So I, I think you know, if if you look at it, you know, in in a kind of in in a through a therapeutic lens, um, anxiety feels very similar to excitement, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of all the kind of cortisol mm -hmm. and, and all the adrenaline and, and your amygdala is, you know, overactivated, you know, as, as we know. So traditionally, lots of entry level crimes have been around thrill seeking. So 20 or 30 years ago, it would have been stealing cars. So the whole kind of excitement of stealing cars and driving around in, in a stolen car has now been replaced, you know, a, li a little bit due to, you know, kind of car security. They're diff more difficult to steal um, these days, but now street robberies or mm -hmm. having gang feuds. But that's, you know, you've got lots of kids who are carrying around all of this kind of hyper energy, you know, from, from their, you know, th th from the environments that, that they come from and taking it out onto the streets. So this is where actually they're, they're enacting or, or trying to get rid of you know, all, all of the feelings that they've accrued mm. um, at home by, by taking part in all of these really risky and dangerous um, activities which keep them on the edge because actually that's the only place that they really know how to exist um, is on the edge. And, and again, you know, this is all unconscious. They don't realise this. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing we notice when people start talking about it. They say, looking back, I just didn't see it. You know, they just, that was how they lived and they didn't know any different. And um, I guess it's easy to get drawn into something and not really think because you are constantly seeking that same level of the hormones that, you know, you've become used to. That ang anxiety produces those hormones in your body and you're, you're getting used to that level. So you're unconsciously looking, well, how do I get back to it? Because it would seem such a low without them. Um, and naturally people don't understand without stopping and somebody intervening and saying because I think the thing with the power threat meaning framework would be that you'd ask somebody that child in the school what's happened to you mm -hmm. what's happening around you whereas the children will often act out and then be excluded from school which makes them feel more rejected rather than asking you know what is happening that's making you respond in this way to try and help them understand so I guess it's finding a way for people to intervene earlier and the, and the person being receptive to it which they're not always able to be um, but often I've people I've spoken to will say you know I tried to tell somebody and they didn't really listen or they didn't really do any believe me or they didn't do anything about it 
Um, so some people have tried to talk about it, but it's in terms of that level of power, it's very difficult to talk to somebody and in authority and trust that they're going to do the right thing for you. I think I don't understand, especially if they're in a different culture themselves, because I think culture makes such a big difference. Um, I think we recognise as forensic psychologists, we tend to be white middle class women. And so that's mm -hmm. very different cultures of the people we work with. And so we have to sort of acknowledge that privilege and acknowledge the differences and try to think about how do we get past that and re recognising it and not pretending it's not happening, but recognise it and do something different to uh, connect on the level. I think that's a really important point you're making, Joey. Um, you know, that in, in terms of recognising difference, um, you know, kind of, and, and recognising there's always potential for, you know, implicit assumptions mm. uh, that we all carry. Um, you know, we're starting to have conversations now about unconscious bias. Mm. They're very uncomfortable conversations. Mm. But I think, you know, if we look at school exclusions, um, I think, you know, black boys are three times as likely to be excluded from school as, as white boys. Now, you know, does that mean that biologically, Mm. black boys are three times worse than mm. white boys or is there something actually happening mm. so with the professionals who are taking the choice you know whether to you know include or exclude uh, mm. these young men so again i think by the time many of these young men arrive in the criminal justice system um they are very they're keenly aware mm. um of how they've been treated before so i think it's, it's why it's even more important for professionals to ensure that they're not providing another reenactment, mm. you know, of episodes of this young person's life mm. you know, in, in terms of how we do engage with different social and, and cultural and, and community experiences and that maybe we're, we're able to make space to accommodate that and also hold ourselves up to scrutiny and to be accountable, you know, for, for the decisions that we're making definitely and be aware of them because we're not going to be aware like you say it's an unconscious bias and so if we're looking to think if our stereotypes are that that's how people are we're going to keep and if we're, unless we're not aware of them we're not going to um, do something about it i don't know if you remember paul once we had a cup of coffee together and somebody made me a cup of coffee in a cup which had oliver cromwell on i don't know if you remember <laughs> being an irish person it was quite an offensive thing and the person would never have it would never have occurred to them <laughs> but um i was like of all the cups you could have given me and i've never even seen a cup with oliver cromwell why anybody would have a cup with oliver cromwell on but you know the person was totally unaware of it but um it is, you know, people are just, you know, do these things without even thinking about it. And I, th I think that's where we come to cultural competence, mm. you know. So, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it's so multi-layered um, because, you know, again, the question will be that we, you know, the, the government set up a few years ago, the Troubled Families Unit. So it, it, it recognises that there are families that have problems. But, you know, in terms of particular communities that seem to be stereotyped more, um, to, you know, where there's an expectation of lower educational outcomes or, you know, or, or more of a propensity to criminality or violence, you know, so we, we're now seeing more um, higher, higher proportion of particular communities coming into the criminal justice system, even though we understand these are universal mm. problems. As you were saying, it was, it was, it was quite interesting, you used the word being receptive um, to a young person and what are the barriers um, that prevent a professional being receptive to what a young person um, presents to them, you know, in, in terms of their issues, in terms of their needs. And I find, you know, I, 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 I've been very keen, um, you know, to focus on, you know, these, these particular demographics. So, you know, in particular, young black men, and, you know, African and Caribbean um, descent, who, you know, there's, you know, the Lamy report a few years ago looked at, you know, lower outcomes and lower levels of engagement for um, BME communities within the criminal justice system. Um, so how can we develop more culturally competent approaches that understand their cultural experience, um, that un understand the impacts of the sense of loss, I think that lots of immigrant mm. communities go through, and then once you're second or third generation, um, how do you square off a sense of identity um, you, where you're balancing the identity that your grandparents brought from where they came from um, with your experiences here in Britain? 
And, and I, I think that that's, um, again, a, a really important issue that people struggle to address. And, you know, you've got to be fairly confident um, to address all of these issues. So for me, if you're adopting gang culture, what's the deficit in your community sense of culture? Mm-hmm. So, what, you know, what has society not been able to provide you um, in, in providing you a sense of culture that works for you? Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. same, you know, with, with um, gang identity. So if, if you take a gang name and, and you, you're, you know, thoroughly invested now in being this particular persona um, that the gang identity gives you, then what, what's the deficit in your, your personal sense of identity that this gang identity is filling? And, and, and that's, again, there's, there's a sense of almost acquiescence with all the stereotypes that we know exist in society. So, you know, that there's now, whereas my generation would have really resisted a lot of those stereotypes, it's really interesting to look at younger generations now aspiring to those stereotypes. So how can we make a space where we can have these conversations? And again, if you're from outside of that community, how confident do you feel trying to conduct those conversations? Because I think that's a really important point about how comfortable people feel. And I know certainly for myself as a white middle or middle class female I think sometimes I felt a little bit uncomfortable and you know how do, how do I start those conversations and and I think that there is a lot out there in terms of what you can you know to just have the conversation with the person just ask them what it's like being from that particular community and what life was really like and but I think it can be really uncomfortable at times but I think that's the challenge for professionals and I think there is professionals tend to be silent and but let's just not talk about it let's just you know remain silent because we don't want to say something perhaps that we might feel is wrong or upsetting and that can be a lot of people's anxiety is that I might offend the person if I if I say something but I think actually if you're coming from a very curious approach I know that actually that's really helped some of the conversations I've had with some of my lads and actually help them understand that actually the situations that they grew up in and what you're talking about the trauma that they've experienced isn't normal it's not normal to watch a drive-by shooting at four years of age and for that to be a common experience growing up in the community when you're playing football in the park you know that that's not a normal experience for any person or child to go through um so trying to understand actually how, how that must have been and how do you survive that You know, how and how can we expect people then and, you know, children to make rational decisions when their brains are still developing, when actually it's been impacted by their trauma? How can we actually expect people to make pro-social choices when actually the choice that they have in front of them is to survive and how they survive in the community is to perhaps align themselves with a gang? Mm -hmm. Because that's what keeps them safe and their families safe. Mm -hmm. But I suppose for those children, that is normal. That's their normal. Isn't it? And I think we've thought about this during the pandemic about people keep saying this is the new normal and nobody wants this to be the new normal. So they resist that. But I guess for these children, this has been their norm and they don't know any different. And they think that's mm-hmm. how everybody else, cause as we all do, we think everybody grew up the same way as we do until someone mm-hmm. says, oh, no, that wasn't like that for me. Mm-hmm. And I think what's the one hopeful thing from what I've spoken to of children at the moment is obviously most people are homeschooling and they're having in, they're teaching them about expressing their emotions um, so they're asking them how are you feeling today because there's such a long lot high level of anxiety in everybody's homes at the moment um, and asking them to express and teaching children to express how they feel and um, and people that are going through the trauma and the anxiety of day-to-day living at the moment people are encouraging the children to talk about it express it explain it understand it themselves which you know I just hope that's a that's a consistent thing across the um you know across all schools but it seems a really good initiative because it's so hard for us to express our feelings so what it's like for little children who are in that constant state of anxiety and i guess that's what a lot of the people have gone into gangs have been in that constant state of anxiety as you say paul they might have only seen a you know level of um interpersonal violence in the home once or twice but they never know when it's going to happen again so you're always at that high percentage state waiting is it going to happen today is it going to happen today and so you've always got that level of anxiety and so i think i think that's you know really you know where it's important for professionals you know to to be able to accommodate Mm. you know um you know this perspective Mm. you know so especially in in the prison setting where it's about managing risk you know primarily and, and that really means, you know, kind of managing, you know, the potential for physical acts of violence. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and again, 
placing the young person in a you know power threat meaning framework where the young person is the threat <laughs> you know so so i i think it, it's it, it's you know for what i find you know in, in trying to create spaces for the young people um to be allowed to be vulnerable um you know and 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 to be allowed to be vulnerable amongst each other mm. um you know it is 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 something that once they realize this is happening they they actually come to really value you know mm. that that i can have a couple of hours off i can come to a group and we shut the door and you know and i accept i say to them look i understand out on the wing around the pool table you've got to talk rubbish and you've got to maintain your bravado and and you can't be weak i fully understand that and you know i wouldn't expect you to turn into the dalai lama um mm. on the wing you know but for a couple of hours you know let's let's be real you know and and let let's challenge ourselves um to try and be honest um mm with ourselves and, and with each other. And that actually it, it's very unburdening um, for them. So it, it can be done. Um, I don't know what the challenges are at, at Owlsby and Grendon, you know, in, in terms of trying to really, really implement, you know, that, that type of space or create those types of spaces. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think the environment in which you're trying to do it is, is key. And, and I guess I've even noticed that sometimes when I've had sessions on perhaps one of the main wings versus when I have it in the department of the service that I'm in at the moment where we've got particular therapy rooms that are set up for people to allow themselves to maybe express themselves more openly, they have a much more meaningful engagement. Whereas on the wing, it's really, really busy. There's lots of noise. There might be alarm bells going off because there's incidents going on. The regime, might, people might be going out and exercise, but there's a lot of noise. Um, and you can see people kind of scanning out, being really hyper vigilant. You can see it in the room. Whereas I think when you take them to a space where it's just, it's a little bit more calm, you can just maybe have a cup of tea, just have a conversation with someone. And, and I, I think in my approach would be have yeah just have a conversation you know it doesn't necessarily have to be a structured initially anyway it doesn't necessarily have to be a structured approach that you take it's having a conversation with them and and just allowing them to feel at ease and feel safe yeah having um conducted sort of interviews with people on a, a mainstream wing um you can feel the anxiety and, and just the fact you're walking into a room with somebody is alerting other people to the fact they're doing that and so they know they're going to be questioned about it later um and you know asked what who was that what why were you talking to them and so you know that's you almost feel the equivalent of being a police officer by going into a room with somebody um and so i don't i don't think people can really relax um you know i don't i find anxiety provoking so i'm sure the residents of any prison must when they you know, identified as going into a room to talk to a psychologist so that and actually ideally that the whole environment would be like that not just the community not just the room where you're having your therapy groups but i think that's taken a while to gradually have that um, environment especially with younger people because as you said paul they can often go into prison and continue their gang life um, and what we often see is people will con um, not necessarily have people from their own gang in the prison, but they'll ally themselves to an, a similar gang so that they've got the same, there might not be the same people in with them, but they've got a similar structure around them. Um, and that will become their, their framework for safety. Uh, so um, it's them identifying that that's what they're doing and what could they do differently would be what we want them to do, really. Um, but it's it's not you know the prison life must be a very frightening one <laughs> so you can't blame people for wanting to have protection around them i guess it comes back to that survival doesn't it i guess how people survive in the environments that they grow are, are, are in at that time and for survival in prison that might mean that someone needs to align themselves to a gang for fear of retaliation from a rival gang from the community or or, or something else and you know I, I kind of think sometimes I some of the lads that I work with is spoke speak with when they're coming across the prison and they see someone from that might have had perhaps an issue in the community or the, and but they both kind of stop and look at each other mm -hmm. but it's a split second decision and if one of them perceive that the other is a threat they'll, they'll just react to it because it's for them they view it as well it's life or death and they yeah. genuinely do yeah. believe that and you know we know that's true as well you know that actually it is life or death for, for these people, for the young men, actually. And, you know, that that, that is a survival response. Mm. And actually what death might be would be loss of face to them. Well, I was about to say that. Mm. That, yeah. that, was, that was the thing that was, you know, jumping out at me. Because I think, again, and this is, again, where it's about understanding the culture, you know, mm. that, that these young men exist in. So, you know, what, what's, what's culture? Culture is, is your values and your priorities, mm. you know, and, 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 and what you believe in. So actually, within the culture, if you see somebody 
who is perceived of as an enemy who may have done something to a friend of yours and you know you've got this kind of historical baggage your reputation will be harmed if you don't do something if you don't act mm -hmm. against that person so again it is it's, it's about being able to drill down mm -hmm. into you know the, the culture that is, is is dictating all of their choices so again you know that's something that comes up a lot um you know so where where somebody might not even really want to attack mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. person might be scared of that person or might not have a, a personal issue with this person but because he's designated an enemy by gang culture he knows that he'll be penalized mm -hmm. for not doing it so if the word gets out that he saw so and so and and didn't do anything that that he will now be damaged Mm -hmm. um, by that so again it's, it's being able to understand okay these are the rules so mm -hmm. once we understand the rules let's actually sit down and, and try to kind of pick through them and, and work out you know well, how, how, how do these things work out for me how, how are you going to create change abiding by these rules you know in that world you know it does have its own rules um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know it does set its own expectations and its own priorities that are different um, from outside so again you, you can you can come at it from a, a curious perspective um, but again sometimes that can feel quite marginalizing you know so the young person just doesn't feel understood actually you, you're, you're presenting um, a lack of understanding to that person you know in your mind you're saying I'm being open-minded you know mm -hmm. but actually to the young person they're thinking well you just don't understand mm -hmm. I've now got to explain and 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 actually again they may have spent large parts of their life trying to explain things mm -hmm. and not feeling listened to so again we, we might find ourselves creating another enactment mm -hmm. of something in that young person's life without really understanding what we're doing mm -hmm. um within that so i i, I think it, it is important um you know to understand there's there's lots of signifiers and lots of markers um you know not just within gang culture but within the, the particular communities you know, many um, African communities, the concept of family honor is, is really important. You know, so actually the damage that's done to the family in, in particular communities when somebody goes to prison is, is huge. And if, if we're able to understand that, you know, there's lots of work that we can do, you know, around really understanding, you know, that, that actually, you know, the whole community, not just in London, but in Ghana or in Zimbabwe, or, or in Nigeria are now gossiping about this, mm. you know, and, and, and that, that's really damaging to, to your family and, and actually being able to understand that and, and, and create a space for the young person to, to be able to address that. And, and that does a lot in terms of family relationships, but also in terms of their sense of identity. You know, that, oh, look at that. Well, you, you actually come from a community that feels shamed. Mm -hmm you know, by these, by these issues and, and by these outcomes. So how, how do you balance that with your sense of identity? Because you're also part of that community mm -hmm. and you're also part of that family structure. So I, I think sometimes it's very important um, to be able to bring people in. And I, you know, I come from the same type of community that these young men come from, you know, and even though I've never been a criminal, we had a really, there was a very deep and implicit understanding between us and so there were things that were able to come up in the groups that might not normally come up or be recognized in the same way i guess Paul, i would think there'll probably be a lot of people who'd be really curious about this actually and do you find that you know i guess that that has enabled your program to be successful in helping people think about their involvement in gangs and help them move away from it the fact that you have almost had some experience of whether you grew up in a similar community but took a different path. I think that is really important actually. A lot of the psychology talks about experts by experience and, and you in, in some way are, are, are one of those actually. 100% except, you know, I always recall from experts by experience because it's almost, you know, the question I always get, oh, you work with gang members, did you used to be in a gang? So there's an assumption that my expertise is as a criminal. <laughs> you know, 
rather than a, as somebody that, that, you know, lived in the same kind of council housing and went to the same types of schools and had the same experiences in the mm. community, that's all forgotten about. You know, the, the first mm. assumption is, oh, you, you must have been in a gang too. Mm. So again, again it, it, mm. it's interesting. I think what you're talking about, what you're really speaking to, Paul, is something around either the identity, but I guess how we categorise people. Because even you were saying, actually, although I've grown up in an environment, people might assume that I have this offending identity when, when you don't. And similarly, we, we, ha we have this, I think, a natural tendency to kind of view people just by their offending when actually not really thinking about the circumstances that led them there in the first place which is what you're talking about is actually I grew up in a similar environment but I took a different path and actually that was different for other people so it's really trying to understand the person rather than label them as a gang member or a violent um, offender although we try and move away from that language as well to be fair in forensic psychology but you know, actually rather than categorize people. Even, even I had an interesting conversation with a, a governor in a prison um, who had someone who you know does similar work you know that, that works with um, gang members and um, comes from a particular part of London and, and the, the governor said oh you know that that person escaped their environment and and I, I said oh I've got to challenge that because actually most of the people in that community you know work <laughs> and are law-abiding mm -hmm. and, and are decent people so you know the assumption that there's something to be escaped if you mm -hmm. live in that particular location is a really really difficult starting point if we start from from there thinking about things from there mm. we're not going to end up anywhere good so again again mm. there, there, there are just so many embedded and ingrained you know kind of ways of, of thinking that that really need to be challenged you know when, when we're looking at this because you know i i always find you know that that actually people in inner city communities we we do celebrate success you know, we do set, celebrate the kids who go to university and, and who become lawyers or who become doctors. You, if you go on social media, we see all of these stories, you know, and, and we're very proud of these people. And, and it's understanding that these are the cousins um, and, and former school friends of the young people that we've got in jail. So it's, it's kind of bringing the young people in jail back, you know, mm -hmm. in, into the fold, you know, and, that, and that's very much, you know, that kind of where, where my work comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm trying to reclaim these young men. And what we see is that they can go out and make successes of their lives after having made, particularly when they've made mistakes like this at a young age, they can go out and live the rest of their life successfully and, and often feel they've learned a lot about themselves and they want to change and they want to give back. And that's often what we'll see is that people want to give back and they want to talk to young people because they can relate to them and hope that they'll just sort of see, learn from them rather than learn from somebody else. Absolutely. And, and I think I, I think we experience that as well, Jerry, in, in, in my work. But I think what's really hard about that is unless they have felt truly understood and unless that they've felt that they've kind of, um, I guess, healed some of their past difficulties yeah. and some of their abusive experiences or marginalization but that's really really hard mm -hmm. and so in some ways i guess it's almost like healing what's been done to them first before yeah. they can kind of go go out and change but absolutely we definitely see there's lots of you know examples of where people have gone out and you know not committed re or not committed more offending i think it's it's very much about the environment that we create and our role you know in, in ensuring that we're, we're creating an, an environment you know, where we can nurture change. Okay, it's been a really interesting conversation and it's been great to have a ch chance to talk to you and um, sort of share your thoughts about the different experiences you've had, Paul. Yes. And um, it just leaves us to say, let's talk forensic psychology. Mm -hmm.